Good morning. My name is Jeff Valencia, and I'm part of the Air Force staff. And on behalf of the Air Force and the Space Force, I represent the Advanced Battle Management System cross-functional team. Welcome to our mission capability area that's going to talk about battle management, both through the context of JADC2 and the context of the Air and Space Force's contribution to JADC2, ABMS. For those who are probably already aware, JADC2 is focused on how we're going to better connect warfighters that closes domain seams, organizational seams, national seams, platform seams. In other words, how do we connect through data superiority the warfighter in order to create decision advantage? Today, the Department of the Air Force, in close, in close cooperation with our industry partners, are taking on this extraordinarily complex challenge on how we're going to modernize our command and control system, how we're going to create decision advantage both in competition and in conflict. And so today, I'm joined by an esteemed panel of experts in close partnership of some of the key industry leaders that are looking at this problem, both in how do we better understand it, but more importantly, is how do we solve it? And so I'd like to give each of our esteemed panel guests an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, good morning. Uh, Scott Stapp, I think the term expert is, is stretching it on uh, JADC2 for everybody, so uh, we're, we're all learning as we go. Uh, but uh, again, good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm a 30-year Air Force veteran, primarily acquisition engineering and flight tests. Uh, I was the anomaly in the Air Force in my 30-year career, did 19 of it either joint, uh, inter-service or inter-agency. Uh, with three joint staff tours, an OSD tour, a COCOM tour, so the, the J and JADC2 works pretty well for me, so I, at least I understand those elements. I'm currently the uh, corporate CTO for Northrop Grumman, and along with that, I also run JADC2 for the company. Great. Uh, I'm Ross Niebergall. I'm the uh, corporate CTO for L3 Harris, and I spent uh, about 15 years of my career working on uh, strategic and operational command and control systems that span continents or regions of the world. Um, I, I think that uh, this is an incredibly exciting topic to discuss because for the past roughly 100 years, the U.S. has maintained a, a, a command and control infrastructure that's second to none, and that's led us to winning the Cold War and, uh, and, and the war on terror as well. And fundamentally, that command and control infrastructure has been built up by hundreds or even thousands of individual battle management systems and command and control systems that were all honestly exceptional at what they did. And, and the, both the promise and the challenge of JADC2 is to take those stovepipe siloed solutions and release the data from them and turn them into something that can be operated on uh, really across the joint forces. So a, a big challenge, but exciting to talk about it here today. Good morning, my name is Steve Nordland and I run Phantom Works at the Boeing Company. Uh, I found my way uh, to Boeing in a more of an unusual path. I was working in the tech industry and jumped off and did a startup that we were fortunate to support our warfighter and have some good success. Uh, we got acquired by the Boeing company and I've transitioned into several roles uh, in the Boeing leadership team, uh, including running strategy for our defense business and have the pleasure to lead our Phantom Works team uh, now that is based here in the United States and also internationally. Uh, this is a fantastic topic and, and General Valencia, thanks for hosting us and to my partners um, on the stage because this really is gonna be about a partnership. Uh, there's a lot for us to, uh, to, to write in this next chapter of connectivity and command and control, and we look forward to it. We've had a long history in this area in the last couple of chapters around our work around presidential aircraft on the Navy side, E2D, uh, on the U.S. Air Force with E3, and then internationally with our E7 AWNC, uh, such as our allies like the Australians, and how we gather uh, our allies into this is also an incredibly important topic as we go down this path together. And I'm really looking forward to, to the industrial base and uh, our uh, services coming together to really give us that competitive advantage that we have held for some time and keeping the United States technology on the forefront like it should be. Thank you. But now it's my turn to give you guys some homework. But come with me to Macedonia. This is a quote from the Council Lucius Amelius. 
I encourage you to go research what was going on in Rome in 168 BC that drove him to that quote and pull it forward to what we're doing today. Now, I'm going to set a bit of a foundation before we go to your questions because it's most important as we address what's on your mind. But before I do so, let's acknowledge one thing. Advanced battle management system is complex, but not impossible. It's driving us to rethink many of the ways of which we've thought about command and control in the past, and many of which are sacred paradigms. It's challenging us to think about, one, how do we exercise command and control over our forces in an environment against an adversary who is well equipped to challenge us in every domain. Two, how do we undermine Red's ability to make decisions? What we have to understand is that when we get very interested in this debate, we have to be willing to set those paradigms aside for a second because ABMS has challenged each of us to think differently and to take on what is arguably probably one of the most complicated and enormous modernization initiatives that we've taken on, at least during our day. And the hard part is ABMS does not deliver a shiny platform on the end of a ramp when it's done. Instead, it's a continuous improvement because we know this. The side that decides is the side that's going to win. Let me lay two foundational premises for you. Number one, our current command and control system for the joint force is inadequate against China. It is inadequate against China. Number two, if we are going to have a military advantage and we're going to be able to win both in competition and conflict, we have to have a new command and control system that delivers decision advantage to our warfighters. If either of those two premises upsets you, then the rest of this conversation is probably not going to be productive. But that's the point. And that's what we're here to get after, is how are we going to dispel those notions that command and control, the sacred paradigm we all hold very passionately close to our heart, it's time to put it out on the table and to have the honest debate. ABMS is not about technology alone. ABMS is about the tools, how we're going to take advantage of those technologies, and it's about reimagining TTPs and how our warfighters are going to interact in a data-saturated world. Don't hear me to say the technology is not important, but also don't hear me to tell you that we're waiting for the technology. It's here today. But we have to start reimagining our tools. We've got to start putting it into the hands of the warfighters to help us to, to form those tools, and most importantly, how can we reimagine the way in which we execute command and control. This is as timeless as warfare. It's complex and oftentimes emotional. If we don't understand it at first, and you're one of those few or many, you're not alone. A lot of us struggle to grasp the complexity of advanced battle management system, and what's important, and why you're up here, and you see one of me and three of them, is because we are not going to do this alone. We are not going to dream up the solution sitting in a cubicle within the Pentagon or in the bowels of our warfighting institutions alone, but we're going to bring all those together and we're going to partner with our industry partners who have the expertise so that we can both understand the problem and develop the solution together. I would just ask this. If you don't understand it, it may not be because it's flawed. It may be because we don't hear your voice and we invite you into the conversation. And we invite you into the conversation, but just know this, it's really hard work, and it's gonna take us to reimagine it in ways that we haven't been challenged in our thinking in a long time, and it's gonna put a strain on a lot of the ways in which we've held to be true and sacred, which is challenging organizations, but don't let it challenge our commitment that we have to get after this. There is no other option, there is no plan B. So we're in this together. So let's get started. You guys are already have uh, been able to find the technology to start posting your questions, and I'm going to entertain your questions, but I'm also going to take the power of the mic, and I'm going to ask the first question. And so I'm going to ask our, our, across our distinguished panel, one of the challenges that vexes us the most today is our ability to share data is at the heart of what we imagine the future of command and control. But one of our largest challenges is we have to connect legacy systems today. Legacy systems that were oftentimes developed where they didn't necessarily put the value on data sharing the way we put value on data sharing today. I'm interested in your thoughts and what is the best approach, how we're going to take what is a heterogeneous family of systems and how can we bring them together so they behave 
as if they're homogeneous. Okay, uh, I'll start. So uh, I think Secretary Kendall said yesterday, this is all about one team, one fight, right? And so uh, a guy who came out of the joint staff, lots of time in the joint world, I, I will tell you that the old paradigm was joint meant joint deconfliction, right? It, it, was, it was just making sure the services didn't frag each other. We're now at a point where the services actually have to fight as one team, right? So when you start looking at these, these old heterogeneous genius systems, it's, it's actually, I, I believe it's not as complex as we make it. And, and what I would say is, is everybody, I feel like everybody is looking at, they're looking for the final answer for what ABMS is or JADC2. And the issue is JADC2 is not a destination, it's a journey. And, it, and, and the guy, idea is that you start out with one step at a time, start moving forward. So a good example is there was a flight test done uh, maybe three weeks, four weeks ago on a system called IBCS, Integrated Air and Missile Defense Battle Command System. It's an Army system for those who remember the old days. It was really about Sentinel radars and Patriot missile systems and the BMC-2. Very closed off system. You actually couldn't change anything out without changing all the elements to it. That system has been re-architected, so it's open architected. So they actually fused in a Marine Corps Gator radar, fused in an F-35 radar so you have an elevated sensor did a live fire demonstration on a drone that was simulating a cruise missile and shot it down. The unique piece of that was that all the Sentinel radars were jammed. So it is the first time they used inorganic sensors to shoot down a missile, and they used it from others. The data was then taken, and it was, it was shown it could actually fuse into CEC, into an Aegis cruiser, and you could have used an SM6 to shoot it. That, that, that's really the start. So, so the idea is, is what happens if you now start to decide to fuse in a space sensor, right? So, so as, as we look at ABMS and JADC2, as military folks, we all think of the OODA loop, right? This is really about, third offset, it's really about turning your OODA loop three orders of magnitude faster than your adversary. The first piece of observe in a highly contested environment is gonna have to come from space, right? It's now a new service, which means you definitely need that data if you wanna orient, decide, and act. So that's the next piece, fusing it in. But I think it's about taking small steps with wins, starting to make it operational, and fusing in the next pieces. And, and, I, and I will get off really quick, but I, I will tell you, a good commercial example is folks who ended up, you know, 15 years ago doing a home entertainment system. You, you, you could hardwire everything in from your TV to your speakers to everything else, and it was painful. What they learned over time is the next generation seamlessly plugged in through the internet. What we need to do now is go through the hard pieces of, of really pushing those systems together, but as it migrates to the next generation, they will seamlessly hook together. Uh, there were so many comments that I want to discuss more, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll move on to, uh, to, to actually answering your, your question, General. So, um, you know, one of the challenges that we have uh, in the defense sector is that we spent so much focus over the last hundred years building hardware that we started thinking of everything as hardware. We had to build it right the first time, make it perfect, make it so that we, uh, that it was meeting 100% of the requirements. And the consequence of that was that it had minimal ability to evolve and change and be dynamic in how it operates. And now, you know, with continuous integration and DevSecOps, we've started learning about uh, continuous integration and recognizing that at least with software, you should think of software as never being finished. It's always going to evolve. It's always going to continue. And that's the strength of it. So now back to the question about how do you take these heterogeneous systems and integrate them into a homogeneous solution? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is take the principles of modular open system approach and simply break open the interfaces between these things. Public, publish the interfaces. The government generally owns all that information, so make it available for industry to actually innovate on and create those inorganic connections between those different systems. And that's when we will really be able to start realizing um, not, not, not a major forklift upgrade of these systems, but this incremental improvement um, to make them better and better and better. Yeah, I, I would echo uh, many of the points that uh, my two colleagues may, made. You know, when I think about this topic and this issue, um, it's, you know, it's the car driving down the highway 80 miles an hour and you gotta change all four tires while it's going down the highway. That, that's, that's the challenge in front of us. So the incremental approach um, is absolutely uh, critical for us to do that. 
uh, in the process of doing that um, with, our, with new platforms that we continue to develop and, and in our legacy platforms, we have to extend what we've been learning and experiencing in digital engineering to the legacy platforms as well. Because as, as soon as we get those new incremental improvements in, technology is moving at a speed that we, ha we have to continue to iterate. So we have to get to, the, first of all, the digital uh, platforms that allow us to continue to da down that road. So when we have to change the tires as it's going down the road, it's not as big of a challenge. So both in, in all of our new development programs that we have, the requirements that we have that flexibility, have that key integration of digital engineering in what we're doing, and then going back to our legacy systems and digitizing in a way that continues to have that flexibility and allow that evolution to continue. Thank you. Let me uh, try to somewhat uh, s summarize together what's becoming a common theme in the questions, which by the way, thank you, there's plenty up here, but keep them coming. We'll get through as many as we can. Is this idea of data ownership and how it reflects both, and sometimes it's the ownership where an organization or maybe a nation feels like they own the data, which I get as a policy piece to it, but sometimes it reflects itself from proprietary ownership that creates a bit of a challenge driving that interoperability between systems. I'd be interested in your guys' thoughts from the panel on that question. Okay, so we'll go around again. So, so what, I, what I will tell you from Northrop Grumman, what our belief is, is no one should own the net but the U.S. government. No one should own the data but the U.S. government. We, we are moving into a new system where everything has to be open architected and open data standards, just period. And that, that comes from our CEO, so I'm not sticking my neck out there too far. Um, uh, but, but, but the only way to make that accessible is to understand, because no, we're not all going to have the same data standards. It's again, I mean, we, there's so much to learn from the commercial internet of things. How they look at data, how they used it, how they publish it, what the interfaces look like. But for, for industry, we're, we're looking at new models of how you look at this stuff. And, and Russ talked about, you know, software. It, it's a perfect example. We, we don't, you, you own the data on your computer but you need a system like Microsoft Office to make the data usable, right? It's licensed. What you're gonna see, I think, in defense industries, we don't own the data, but we will develop tools that, that create fusion, that actually fuse different systems together as you look at different sensors, that will actually make your data more usable. And because you're gonna constantly be changing out systems, it won't be much different than Microsoft, where they're constantly doing upgrades to what those systems are to make them more effective. But I think defense industry is gonna to have to look at new models of how they look at that data and that data sharing. But again, uh, from our standpoint, it does need to be open architected and open data standards. Yeah, and, and again, you know, there's a lot of work that's gonna go into this. Some of it's policy, but some of it is also just a change in the way industry behaves. And, and you know, echoing what Scott said and going back to my theme of modular and open systems approach, I heard this phrase last week that um, uh, open systems approach means that the IP stays in the box and everything between the boxes is completely open. I think that was a great simplistic explanation of, of, of what open systems will allow you to achieve and that's the ability to share that data and, and let everybody get to it. You know, ultimately, what I think that the Air Force needs is to be able to pick the best of breed of various components and various systems and architect the solution. I think the, 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 in this new paradigm, um, the Air Force is going to have a lot more responsibility and, and ownership of the overall architecture that we're developing that will allow us to achieve some of this promise. Uh, again, I, I agree with both of the other panelists. Um, I would just add, I would under, uh, probably footstop a couple of things. Uh, one is I, I think our ability to reach into the commercial marketplace and uh, try to accelerate what we're trying to do is a huge advantage for us. And that brings in a, a, you know, another player, if you will, into this discussion around uh, data rights. Uh, and I think in general, one of our one of the one of the things that we have to stay focused on are the are some of the policy issues. Um, some of the technology pieces of this, we get really focused on the technology, but coming up with the policy issues that allow you know industry and government to work together. 
absolutely, the government, I, I, when I talk about this all the time, is the, the person that's going to own the network is going to be the government. The person that's going to own the data is going to be the government. Uh, we got to figure out how do we add value in facilitating the decision making and the manipulation of the data, the timely delivery of the data to make it all happen so the operator can benefit from it and have what he needs when he needs it to decide. If I could just add something onto your comment, you're right that there are other parties involved in this that are non-traditional, and that is, you know, we haven't really talked about the importance of the cloud, the importance of artificial intelligence, machine learning. I think artificial intelligence and machine learning in and of itself, um, oftentimes the commercial industries have better algorithms, have better tools for doing that. But what we as an industry need to do is to leverage that capability because I think that what the Air Force is looking for is autonomy more than just an algorithm that can, that can pull a threat out of an image. And so I think we really do have to be more holistic about, about really taking advantage of all that the U.S. industry has to offer in solving these problems. Right, and, and I'm gonna add one piece too, is because is this does become a policy issue, right? Which is, uh, to me, when you, when you talk data sharing, it's really about fusion of multi-source data to actually get a better product, right? When you start looking at, at multi-sources of data, you automatically get into multi-security. Multi-level security is, is, is gonna be the big policy driver. So it's one area I think I can speak to. I was the AQL director for the Air Force. I was the OSD uh, SAPCO, so director of special programs for the department. And what you see is you can actually, we, we used to do this all the time, you can mix multi-source data from unclassified through collateral up through TSSEI and SAPSAR. You blend it all up and you can usually spit it out at a collateral level. Because right now, for the warfighters to be, for data to be useful to the warfighter, it's gotta be at the collateral level or below. And when you start bringing in your allies, five eyes, it's gonna have to be at the collateral level. You can do that, and it's actually not that difficult. And the more sensors you get, the more data you get in, the easier it is to obfuscate and push it out at a lower level. But it is a policy issue of mixing data. That's, I mean, it is truly a policy issue between TSSAI and SAPSAR and collateral. Overcoming that will go a long way to actually making data usable for everybody. Another question that's... Uh kind of shifting gears a little bit out of the policy world because it makes all of our heads hurt. But t talking a bit about just the, the practicality of this idea of fused data or data at the fingertips of our warfighters, and we start to talk about the tactical edge. And, and that becomes a difficult thing to define because in some cases the tactical edge is putting the data on or taken off of some exquisite platform, and other times it's putting it on or taking it off of somebody like a TACP who is a, you know, a, a single entity out in a contested area. I'd be curious your guys' thoughts about how do we make this data available at the tactical edge, and maybe how do we even constrain that conversation in a productive way? Maybe I could just start this one, and, and, and again, that's a fantastic question, and, and one, of the, one of the things that's embedded in that question is how do I actually even get the data to the tactical edge? Um, and at the core of all of this is resilient communication. I think one of the things that, that we haven't touched on yet is this idea that a lot of our legacy systems, you know, the AOC, TBMCS, uh, and others, were built in a time when we didn't necessarily anticipate our, our communication to be contested. And, and, you know, I think that, you know, one of our focuses is on spectrum superiority, which is the ability to operate in the spectrum, uh, to uh, obscure our operation in the spectrum, so through LPI, LPD, AJ communication, to observe what our adversaries are doing in the spectrum, and then to obstruct it as well. So, you know, focusing on getting the mechanism, the path to get that data to the tactical edge is, is absolutely key, and I think that another aspect of this is we know that we're not gonna have perfect communication. We know that our systems have to be developed and to be resilient when they're out of that data connection. And, and that's really where I think autonomy and artificial intelligence come into play, is to be able to anticipate what systems are going to be doing when they're cut off and then resynchronize quickly when they get back up to it. There was a, a, a lot in that, but you know, I think that that's, that's part of how do I, what do I do with information at the tactical edge? And we're not gonna have the bandwidth to get everything there. So again, it's putting together data models that can clearly filter down to what an individual user wants at an individual guaranteed time. Yeah, I would add, I would add um, and I'm glad we're talking about technology instead of policy too. Uh, 
but I, I don't think we can underestimate the, the computing power and capability that we need on the edge as much as we can get out there from every aspect of computing from processor to storage to connectivity. Uh, there's never enough bandwidth. Uh, there's always too much latency. All of those things we got to just continue to, to press. And again, we got to design in a way where it's, it's compartmentalized in a way where we can continue to do the upgrade because it's technology is not going to change. We've all seen that. And so we can learn a lot from the commercial world on where edge computing is going and use that a little bit of a north star of how do we want to design and set our requirements going forward. So we're really looking futuristic. You know, where, where, is the, where is the optimum area that we think technology can take us over the next several decades? And then how do we work backwards and then incrementally, ingra uh, incrementally uh, increase our capability over time and work that path to that future state? Okay, so all four services are already working tactical edge capabilities. So uh, for those who are familiar, maritime targeting cell of flow for the Navy, maritime targeting cell expeditionary uh, for the Marine Corps, Titan for the Army, and CMCC for the Air Force, right? They, 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 are, they are tactical edge capabilities and, and, and compute is gonna be important and data storage and using it in the cloud. But the most important piece is connectivity. You, you, you can't, unless you're connecting to something who's giving you data. So all the, the, the maritime targeting solo float and expeditionary are actually taking downlinks directly from space. So they don't take it from the center's back CONUS or other places. And when we say tactical edge, I think we're not talking the KOC or the AOC. You're talking really at the tactical edge. Um, and, and those systems in small footprints take data from space, fuse it together, can take it from airborne and other systems, can actually start integrating and working with each other, CMCC and others. And then the idea is, is exactly what Ross said, which is we, um, when, you, when you take your cell phone and you step out of the net, it, it continues to keep updated, basically fuses information with what it has. But when you step back in, it picks it all up. This is not, it's really not a cosmic thing for us to follow what the commercial industry has done. It's getting those footprints out, getting the direct downlinks from both space, air, sea, fusing it together, making it available, and having it on a common structure so all the services can use it. Because they don't all want the same data. Somebody on a ship wants different data than, some, than a Marine who's going to be uh, basically on shore and is going to want different data than an aircraft that's going to be in the air. But, but having that data available is going to be critical. Yeah, and, and, and just to, again, foot stomp this, comms connectivity is absolutely critical to this. I've sometimes wondered why it wasn't called JADC3, just to recognize that yeah. without comms, yeah. it's not going to work. It's, thank, thank it's you. foundational. Let me shift a little bit from the technology to the person. And, and so, uh, it, you know, frankly, many of us grew up in a day that data wasn't necessarily the premium of which it is today. And in fact, a lot of times we're talking a lot about data scientists, systems engineering. We're, we're actually introducing a new lexicon into our vocabulary of AI, ML, M2M. And these are terms that, quite frankly, I don't necessarily know if we within the uniform fully appreciate and understand the, the complexity of what it takes to, one, be able to interact with these professionals, but then, two, is, is how do we shape our force in a data-saturated world? I'd be curious in your guys' thoughts because this is not a new challenge that industry had to already address. Well, I'll, you want to start? You have to get it started. <laughs> yeah. uh, what I tell our team all the time is Boeing's a software company. Yeah, we make airplanes and we make satellites and we make other weapon systems. We make commercial airplanes, but we are a software company. And I think that's you know if, if you if you think about that for a second, and just like. Uh, my gentlemen uh, to, my, to my right here, their companies are software companies. Uh, I think that we have to get into the mindset of, of who we are today and where the world's going. And that opens up a, a lot of conversation around uh, everything from our competition uh, for talent uh, to get the right talent focus on the problem at hand that we got to go solve for the warfighter all the way through to you know, how we invest our resources um, you know, in, from an engineering standpoint uh, inside our companies. And so to me, it's waking up every day and reminding myself that we're a software company. I, I think that's, that's a great comment. And you know, within, within L3 Harris, our fastest growing engineering discipline is software. You know, 
when it comes to data scientists, artificial intelligence, I kind of reflect back to the 60s when, when software, uh, when high-level programming languages first became popular, they were still done by electrical engineers. And I think in many an industry, um, did software because they had to, not because they wanted to. It was really forced into the equation, and it wasn't until the 80s that we started to recognize the, the importance of software. And now, you know, companies like ours are really software companies. Software unleashes the power of these open systems. And, and that's where we're gonna have to get our heads wrapped around with artificial intelligence and data science. And, and I think, you know, you know, we're gonna have to continue in our industry growing this skill set. And I think the services are going to have to start recognizing that as well to become more intelligent consumers of it. So uh, I, I, think, I think people get wrapped around the complexity of what we're talking about. We say ABMS and JADC2, right? But, but to date, everybody in here is using a cell phone that is using vast amounts of data, vast amounts of artificial intelligence. You essentially command and control your whole life off a single device. And I will tell you, that didn't happen 15 years ago. You can do your finances, you can do your medical records, you can actually work off of it, you can uh, you know, basically watch TV, do entertainment, do travel, you can do all your personal items off it, everything off of a single device. And what's going on behind it, you don't have to know. What you, ha what you know is it's incredibly useful. So when you look at AIML, and everybody's a part of it today, which is, if you look at a company like Visa, since 2014, just doing, using AIML and fraud detection saves $25 billion a year today. Doing fraud, and everybody gets fraud notices, right? Hey, is, did it, was this really your purchase, was it not? So you're participating in AIML all the time. If you can imagine us doing the same thing, and you now have, rather than looking at habit patterns of your life and how you spend to know when you are or not spending something that's you, um, look at our space systems observing adversaries who understand their habit patterns every day. They start to understand what's normal, what's not normal, and they notify warfighters war when they see anomalies. But I, I think all of us are going to be doing, I mean, we are all software companies, but the commercial world is actually really far ahead when it comes to AIML. What we provide is mission integration. What defense industry really understands is mission capability and how you use those tools to integrate them into capabilities. Yeah, and I think that's a great comment, Scott. But it's interesting that you know our life has changed because of our because of our our, our portable devices over the last 15 years. But those portable devices took 15 years, and they also have a user base of about six billion people to continually refine it, enhance it, and push that commercial industry along quicker. We in defense have to figure out how to do it in less than 15 years with a smaller user base. And, and that's one of our challenges. No, absolutely. But I, th I think it's a good, but, but we shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. We should be able to use that as a site picture. And we need to be able to do it in two years. And we need to be able to, and again, just like um, services are, are going to have to work together, defense industry is going to have to integrate and work the exact same way. We're going to have to work very closely together. Um, but, but I think it is, it is doable. There, there is a site picture out there that we can follow. So shifting, not to trundle back into policy, but yet equally complex is the process of acquisition. And sometimes what orbits around this conversation is that the tech maturation cycle within the commercial industry is far faster than our acquisition cycle can keep up, oftentimes leaving us fielding capabilities that are seemingly irrelevant by comparison to emerging capabilities. I'd be interested in the panelists' thoughts on whether you have any recommendations on revising the Clean Air Cohen Act acquisition processes that are going to help us to keep up as the technology maturation cycles accelerate. Okay, I'll start this one. Um, so the, the acquisition process was designed and built for a different time, right? So one of, one of the issues I start with, so I, I ran the JROC um, for two years as one of my assignments. The requirements process is is actually way too slow, too stifled. We're used to we're used to um, in in defense industry of having the department go. I need you to I need you to build this widget. I need it to weigh this much. I need it to go this far. I need it to carry this many weapons. Here's your threshold. Here's your objective. Here's the rough cost. Go fight it out and see who can get it to me for the best cost. We're hitting a time where they don't necessarily know exactly what requirements they want. They don't know so so there it almost has to go back to a threat based system that says, we have a problem, uh, here's what we want the outcome to look like, defense industry, go come up with, with greenfield, clean sheet ideas on how we can do it 
without setting hardcore requirements. And then the acquisition cycle, just in general, this is, this is from the services all the way to the hill. We, we budget and appropriate for widgets. We don't budget and appropriate for the glueware that hooks the widgets together. And, if, and, and whether you're talking in the services and in the department or I was talking to the appropriators on the hill, the appropriators are actually assigned to widgets. So if you really want to talk about integrating a bunch of systems together and getting the data to share, you got to get like five appropriators together to talk across services and across systems. So, so the system does have to be re-looked at. But I think in the meantime, we're going to have to do a little bit of, of um, brute forcing it through the system until the system does change. Yeah, and I think we're all aware of these programs that you know take three years to baseline requirements, and then you end up with 4,200 A-level requirements, and it goes takes three years to get the contract, and seven years for industry to develop the product, and so now we're 10 years into a baseline set of requirements, half of which are now irrelevant to the mission. And you know somehow we've got to change change that paradigm and and you know change change our acquisition policy. I used to use the phrase minimum viable product, but that somehow has bad connotations that is not usable to you. I think now a more common phrase is minimum lovable product. We've got to get something into the hands of the user that they can pound on and and vet and give feedback. But we've got to be in this continuous recognize that the product is never finished and that's the way it should be built in the first place. So I worked in uh, the defense industry uh, for Boeing and I left and I worked in the commercial side of our business for several years. Before I left I was on a panel and I was asked about how we're going to change the acquisition process and here I am back on my first panel in the defense industry and I'm being asked about how we're going to change the defense process and uh, General, you made some really important comments at the opening. Things like, this is disruptive, it's different. We gotta get our heads wrapped around. I think in industry, we gotta change our muscle memory. And in the government, we gotta change our muscle memory. And we gotta come together and collaborate and partner. It would take an act of Congress to change the procurement process. We can't wait for that. We don't have time. There is an emerging threat. There is a threat. And so at the end of the day, it's going to take leadership. And so we're going to have to, in the industry side, we're going to have to get down to the levels where the conflict is happening. And we're going to have to get it resolved. And on the government side, we've got to get down to levels where the people are just doing good work too, and conflict is happening, and we've got to get it resolved. And that's the, I think, the only way it's going to be a hand-to-hand -hand combat to get us to go quicker. And I think the collaboration and the partnership, as you actually pointed out in your opening, the word partnership, incredibly important. Because this is not about one company owning JADC2 or who owns the network or who owns the data. This is about how do we evolve our ecosystem for war fighting to a whole new ecosystem that doesn't exist today for the good of our country and to go fight the enemy. And that's just gonna, it's a leadership issue. And, and I'll just follow on. I, I know Secretary Kendall was talking about this is all, it's really China, 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 right? And, and I will tell you, China doesn't have JSIDs or the DFAR. So, so their ability to move fast and differently, we ought to look at that and understand that, that sometimes with requirements, and, and again, kind of being in that world, we, we, we used to ask for what we called desirements, what you really wanted if you, you know, at the end goal, as opposed to what's good enough. So rather than min viable product, it needs to be a continuous viable product. And it needs to migrate, move forward, and it needs to just show that you're constantly changing the state at where we're at. Again, software on, in, in the commercial worlds, it's, you know, every time you get, you get a new upgrade to your phone, you know, probably every two months. It's those kind of things that are constantly changing the dynamics of, of what your system looks like and operates. Well, we have a ton more questions here that we just didn't have the time to get to, but we'll stay up here, allow you guys to come up and talk to us. Don't hold us until all the sandwiches are gone, though. But uh, we are really want to thank our panelists for taking the time to share your insights and your expertise and experiences that you guys each bring to this fight to echo the point that we are doing this together. It is a partnership. And to all of you, thank you for being here. You're on break now. Uh, lunch downstairs. Be back at 110. Thank you.